Okay, so last week, oh, here we go by Kingston, pardon me. Last week, uh, I talked about value and thermodynamics and in general and finished up with talking a bit about dialectic, but much more um, to cover on that today. And the essential question is how do we produce more outputs and inputs, which really is that only the physiocrats it really seriously answered and got the answer right, given what they knew at the time that they wrote, which is exploiting free energy, which they thought was only agriculture, but in fact it's any form of energy we find, not just solar energy, but you know, as we now use coal, nuclear, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the equation I derive, which basically gives energy an essential role in production. If you don't have any energy input, you don't get any output. Uh, eliminate one or the other variable or reduce the energy output one of the other variables to zero. You also re reduce the output contribution to zero because the energy, the coefficients, the alpha and the one minus alpha are applied to the energy inputs as well as to labour and capital. And that's going to turn out to be pretty important today as well. Now, that's what we should have economic theories being compatible with. Okay. You sure that I've got a reasonable regression on that? I'm going to do a lot more work on it in the next couple of years. Um, now, that's not reducing economics to thermodynamics, but it's saying we can't contradict it. We think that economics was contradicting by ignoring the role of energy. Now, on that basis, I'm going to argue today that the strict labour theory of value that Marx says is also incompatible with that, and I'll show you just how incompatible it is. But in Marx, there's a whole amount of th philosophical logic which have been ignored by the by the conventional Marxists who want to handle the labour theory of value. And I've just I, my first academic work was on showing that Marx's theory philosophy contradicted his economics and gave you a better economics if you put it through together. And that's what I'm going to go through today. So I'll go through, first of all, a very, very skimpy version of the conventional version, because what I want to show is how that clashes with the energy aware production function we derived, I derived with you last week. And I'll give you an alternative dialectical interpretation of Marx that contradicts the labour theory of value, but is consistent with this environmentally or energy aware model. Those are some papers of mine on it. The first one is my master's thesis, which is fairly weighty. I haven't published that, but that's online on line my web. The next two articles in the journal of the History of Economic Thought. And the third one is one I haven't yet published a long, long time ago for a few circumstantial reasons as to why. So energy and labour theory of value. If you, if you look at what Marx began, he was actually the first major economist to have a PhD. He had a PhD in philosophy, not in economics. And of course, being German at the time, he was he wasn't actually taught by Hegel, but he's taught by descendants of Hegel. And then, as I cover a bit more detail later, realised he had to understand the economics. And when he started to, he's very critical of what was called political economy. And you can see a philosopher's uh, sort of emotional reaction to what he's reading is a very dry economics set of textbooks by Smith and Ricardo. Uh, it begins by seeming to acknowledge man, but it throws aside this hypocrisy, comes out of its complete cynicism by developing the idea of labour, uh, as the sole essence of wealth, and by proving this to be an anti-human theory. Okay, so he's really having strong negative reactions. This is in 1844, with his first attempts to read um, English uh, political economy. But what he had, when you looked at where, where Smith and Ricardo spoke about this whole idea of where does surplus come from, uh, Smith on farming does show some elements left over from the physiocrats, which I really wish he'd developed a lot more. And here is the one I mentioned last week we were talking about the role of farming. He says, no equal capital puts into motion a greater quantity of productive labour than that of the farmer. Why? Because not only he's labouring servants, but he's labouring cattle, the productive labourers. And frankly, in the energy basis, that's true. You can use the animals to get to the free energy the animals have surplus to their own needs to stay alive is what they can do work for you on the farm. So it's absolutely correct to say that. And then he says, nature labours along with man. But the labourers cost no expense. And again, that's the same sort of thing the physicist was saying. So there are elements of Smith which were still consistent with what he should have learned from the physiocrats. And here again, I mean, he's not, what he's again making the same mistake, the physiocrats, that of not realising that labour in manufacturing also exploits the energy stored in coal and oil, or back in those days, mainly coal. Um, but they're, they're saying, and notice here, said that the labour and labour in cattle uh, occasion. Like the workmen in manufacturers, the reproduction of the value equal to their own consumption together with the owner's profits. Now, again, from a thermodynamical point of view, that's correct. Okay. Um, but he's arguing that the, the, the agriculture does more. Again, that's, that's a hangover from the not so wise, wise elements of the physiocrats limited to the fact that they only knew about agriculture in that sense in, in France at the time. Now, when Marx started reading this stuff, when he's, he's, these are his handwritten notes. 
since published as the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts of 1844, and you find him saying statements like this. <laughs> Makes a profit first on the wages and secondly on the raw materials. Now, again, from a thermodynamical point of view, that's correct. Okay? Uh, but he gradually starts shifting towards the belief that labor is the only source of value. And this, this sort of statement starts saying, the greater the human share in a commodity, the greater the profit of dead capital. I'm not giving page references here, by the way, because there are free versions of this on the web, all with different paginations. So if you just search for the phrase, you'll find where that is in the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts. But over time, he went from the initial lack of acceptance of a labour theory of value to being quite emphatic about it. And the thing which made, one, one of the many things made Marx very, very different to Smith and Ricardo is that if you believe labour is the only source of value, because that's an implication of how your logic is expressed, then they can argue, why did, why did the capitalists get anything? And there are lots of people who are called Ricardian socialists who preceded Marx and argued that because labour is the source of value, they should produce all the output and capitalists are basically exploiting the workers by paying them less than their value. Now, what Marx said is, no, that's wrong. They're paying, the capitalists are paying workers exactly their value from his point of view. So what he said that work, profit is derived even though workers have paid their value uh, and said that you know, capitalism's main problem wasn't that there was uh, ripping off people in that pejorative sense of paying less than you should get, but there were tendencies to crises and ultimate collapse. It's dehumanising, alienating, etc., etc. And I think those things stand up, stand up pretty well to the test of history. Uh, but in his approach, he I've got it in inverted commas because he solved it within the context of believing that labour is the only source of value. He had to explain where does profit come from if all things have changed at their value? Because according to the classical school, they didn't have a utility con con concept in their decision of their arguments about how prices were set. Utility played no active role. So you didn't have marginal utility and marginal cost. You didn't have an increase in utility being seen as a source of output as the neoclassicals later describe it and say did it at the same time. Um, but you have, well, you're paying the cost of production for something, you're selling it for a cost of production, how do you make a profit? And that was never really solved by Smith or Ricardo. Well, Marx's argument would say, well, commodities exchange at their value, and value, he said, normally means the labour time it takes to produce them. Okay. Now, that includes labour time and machinery, which Ricardo managed to leave out quite frequently in his logic. So the labour time it takes to make a machine is the cost of buying the machine. Uh, but he, Marx said under, under capitalism, the capacity to work has now become a commodity. You sell the capacity to work. But what, when you sell it, what do you get back as your sale price? You get the maintenance of that capacity to work, which is subsistence. So Marx said there's a gap between what you can, the, the, the amount of work that can be done by somebody once they've been hired and the subsistence wage needed to keep them alive so they can come up to work the next day. So what you're buying is actual work. What you're paying is the cost of production of subsistence. There's a gap between the two. Let's say it took five hours to produce the subsistence bundle of goods, which is V for variable. Marx used V for variable capital uh, and C for constant capital. By saying labour was variable, what he's saying is that labour can be a source of additional profit. So that's what you pay, and it might be, say, five hours. But the actual work lasts for 10 hours, including some surplus, which goes to the capitalist, and V, which goes back to the worker. And the difference is surplus value. That's where the profit of the capitalist profit comes from. And that's, when you look at the argument, that what Marx was talking about at that stage was that there's something unique about labour. No other commodity, if you sell commodity power uh, in return and be paid in return for the value of the commodity, but you sell the commodity, you get the commodity. And uh, if that's the case, that there's no such distinction with capital, then Marx argued that effectively all the capital does is transfer the labour value that's been used to make it into the machine. There's no additional surplus generated by machinery. And this is actually taken from after Marx. This is the best statement I can find of that oh, allegation. Okay, one, I was even, even sort of proposition, this allegation is in capital. After he developed the alternative logic, I'll be showing you as well, but the, this is a very emphatic statement. However useful a given kind of machine, uh, though it may cost 150 pounds or 500 days labour, it cannot, under any circumstances, add to the value of the product more than 150 quid. In other words, if it costs you that much to make, that's all it adds back. There's no surplus coming out of machinery. So what that means is, when you think about it, 
It means that the machine's contribution to production is equivalent to depreciation. As it wears out, that's the value it transfers, no more than that. That's what Marx is arguing. Now, there have been many, many critiques, and most of my critique arises from his philosophy rather than the, the mathematical. But I want to now take a look at it from the point of view of that energy wear production function I developed last week. And of course, the actual form of the function is still open to development, but the basic idea that GDP is effectively useful work, which is a function of energy, taking available energy and turning it into something which does something you want to have done. Output without energy is impossible. Okay? You simply can't produce output unless you are harnessing energy in some sense. And labour and capital are both means to harness that energy. Now, they, they, they can't be denied. But again, that comes back to Coddington's arguments about if you... If your theory is inconsistent with the thermodynamics, then go away, which is fundamentally what I'm guess saying the labour theory of value should do here. So how does it stack up? Well, badly, um, and I'm still working out just what it actually means. It's this stuff is I've done in the last couple of days. But what it's arguing is that surplus labour, the, the, the labour above and beyond the cost of reproduction of the worker, is the only source of surplus of outputs over inputs. And capital only contributes what it loses in depreciation. So... How can I put that set of beliefs into the equation I showed you last week? Well, I call, I'm still trying to find terms for this. I think it'll be called the Keene equation one of these days, but at the moment I'll call it Cobb Douglas KLE, capital labour energy form, where I explicitly state the amount of capital rather than the other one I showed you where I eliminated capital by talking about the, the gross amount of energy used in industry. So that's the equation. That's going through bit by bit. That's seeing out GDP is useful work. I think it's a, again, this is one thing which these insights have only come from developing the equation, but that's, that's the best possible way to define what GDP is. Hiya. Oh, yeah. well, there's an exam on, I believe, at the moment. Is it, that's for the serious absence of people. Wow. Anyway, we'll get the audience on YouTube instead. Well, I'm actually just going through the labour theory of value now and pulling that apart. So this, this will be recorded and put up. As, I'll put the last lecture on YouTube too, by the way. It's already there. Okay, so that's output as a function of energy throughput, and that, of course, E implies both energy from capital and energy from labour. That's number of unskilled... Now, what I'm working with here, and so does Marx's logic, works with unskilled labour. There's no... There have been a couple of attempts to make a reduction of skilled labour to unskilled labour. Helferding did that. Very pedestrian. It did really just basically convert it back to how much training goes into educating, which, again, again is wrong, but I don't bother with that. So we're looking at units of unskilled labour there. <clears throat> that amalgam, and I'll, I'll pull the amalgam apart later, is the energy harnessed by the unskilled labour per year. So like, again, if you think about, if you were you know, working on a chain gang, you might be eating 4,000 calories of baked beans a day, pumping out 2,000 calories of work, multiply that by the number of days, put it into a, the same energy format as you do for the, uh, the, the uh, metajoules going through the capital, and you've got a comparable term. I'm going to break capital down a bit, but this capital, that's, that again is the number of machines employed. Now, that is a fantasy. We actually can count up the number of machines, but adding them up is rather difficult. How do you add a lathe to a, um, a laser? That sort of thing. Uh, but and I've got the Cambridge, link to the Cambridge controversy there about the definition of capital. But as I've shown you, I can eliminate that K and make the empirical data uh, the basis of the model. We'll still stick with that for the moment. That's the energy per machine, which, of course, if you know, has been a massively rising function per unit of time. Did you watch the takeoff of, uh, of uh, Musk's latest... Um, well, takeoff and landing. That, that rocket, the Falcon 9, which is about to be superseded by the Falcon Heavy, that thing launched 10 satellites into space and landed back on its platform in the ocean intact in 8 minutes and 32 seconds, it wasn't. You know, we really are in the, in, the, in the incredible stage when that can be done. Okay, but that, that, that compares to the amount of energy that... Imagine what you'd need in terms of energy where you couldn't do it in, this, in Smith's, in um, James Watt's days to get something up in the air. Forget it, okay? Phenomenal increase in the amount of energy being used. This is the ratio of available energy to total energy, and that's got to be less than one. Can't be one. Otherwise, you'd say that you can. You don't need to maintain the the, the stage that's fallen, that's landed back on the planet. Yes, you do. And that's the efficiency with which you move. Now, that's that's much much less than one because I think the, to actually define this efficiency term properly, what you have to say is what are you trying to achieve, literally in terms of some physical process. So the easy thing is to imagine 
moving something from one point to another. So if you wanted to think the, the, most, the, the most efficient way that I could move a one kilo weight from this side of the room to that room, which is roughly, which is roughly 10 metres, in one second, okay, what amount of energy would it take on a frictionless surface with no wind resistance? Okay? That's the ultimate definition of efficiency. What we do, if I walk down there, it's going to be a damn sight more energy consumed than if I wrote, skated, skated down on, on a, a skateboard. And, of course, you look at the, the hyperloop, and that's even – even, but we're never going to get to a one ratio there. So those are your basic terms. So how to express Marx's claim that labour is the only source of value with that equation, which, as I've said, if you're wrong, if your theory doesn't come to that equation, it's your theory that's wrong. Well, XL, which is the efficiency, the, the, the convert ratio of – yeah? I just quickly ask how value is measured now. In this case, in this case, I'm pretty much measuring value by energy per unit of time. Okay, okay? fundamentally, that's that's the, like the most practical definition of value you can get. Uh, again, if you think of anything we do right now, this, I always go back to the Game of Thrones as a nice little way of comparing just what's involved in the amount of energy we take on a daily basis versus what within that mythical world, the amount of energy needed to do what they what needed to do. Crossing, let's call it crossing the small ocean which they're doing right now, wind energy, how fast they were doing it, how many oarsmen there are. These days we'd hop on a, on a, a um, uh, surf ski and get across the same thing and far faster. So the, the amount of energy we're using and the, and the um, speed with which we can do things is much, much higher now than it was then. Okay? And then because we're also now trying to... Connected to Marx, so how are we going to... To which, what, to money? No, to Marx. Yeah. How to express Marx's claim, so how, how are we going to relate this? That's what I'm doing right now. Okay, so what what, what, what do you see? If you have Marx's idea of, of surplus divided by the total labour input, okay, that's S divided by C plus B. It's S divided by S plus B. I'm looking just at the labour component right now. So that XL, uh, that's going to be the ratio of S to V plus S. So if you look at XL, it's going to be the amount of available energy, which I'm using X, the, the term that's used for, for useful energy, as opposed to energy you can't exploit, is X exergy. So I'm using X as the symbol for exergy for labour. X exergy is the available energy for labour. That If you think about a, a worker burning 4,000 calories of food a day, then that might be 2,000 calories they can put into work. Okay, so XL is, say, 2,000. EL, the amount of energy you consume per day, 4,000 calories. Uh, the ratio is zero is is uh, one over two effectively one half. So you're saying s divided by v plus s is equal to xl. Now what I can then do is say well let's just pop that into the expression and see what we get. You say the energy available to all worker, which is say four thousand calories a day, times that efficient times the available energy ratio times the efficiency whatever that might be efficiency of labour using literally subscript L for efficiency of labour, you finally get that's going to be the, the level of surplus, and that's 2,000 calories per day, not a ratio, but a, a number of calories, multiplied by the efficiency with which you do the work. Okay? So we put that into the equation. And now what I've got this expression, I haven't yet worked on the capital side, but that's saying that the energy output, the, 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 value, the GDP expressed as useful work, is going to be the amount, number of unskilled workers times the amount of calories per day they can generate times the efficiency with which they've raised to one minus the alpha, this is to have constant returns to scale, multiplied by the remaining term for k, raised to the power of alpha. So we've got halfway there. Now, when Marx says, how does a machine that costs 150 pounds cannot under any circumstances add more than 150 pounds of value what does that imply for the, cap the capital part, do you think? Any ideas? Yeah. That ratio of, 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 of useful work to the cost of the actual energy well, must be zero. That's the only way you can make sense of it. Because the numerator is the useful work done by the machine, a work greater than the cost of production. According to Marx, that's zero. So let's put that into the equation. I get zero output. 
how can I actually get anything other than zero output of this equation? Well, I've got to set the exponent to zero. Okay. So we set the exponent to zero. Pardon me, it's a reanimation the wrong point. Okay. K raised to the zero is one. All the energy components to a uh, uh, capital raised to the zero is also one, even though X, anything raised to the power of zero is one. A little mathematical rule. So you get the total value of our output is equal to the number of unskilled workers times their calorie consumption times the efficiency. And all the energy put in machines counts for nothing. Now there's an Australian term for that, starting with B and ending with T, having eight letters. Okay? Something seriously wrong with the theory that says that. So there's many other critiques of labour theory of value. If you want to see that the most detailed critique of the proportionality issues about rates of profit versus uh, capital labour capital labour ratios, take a look at this book by Steedman, Marx after Schraffer. Uh, and if that's all you've got in Marx, you could ignore it. But there's another interpretation of Marx based on the dialectics, which contradicts the labour theory of value. And it's compatible with this energy production function, and it involves acknowledging something really, really highly, highly unlikely. Marx made a mistake. And I think he knew he made a mistake. I'll take you through the, the, the history of everyone thought of that. From, uh, I've got so many Marxists, the Andrew Kleiman being my favourite instance there. You'll see a guy called Andrew Kleiman, what's called the temporal single system. He is devoutly, and I use that word advisedly, trying to maintain the labour theory of value. And there are plenty of others, some people I quite like, like... Uh, Alan Cockshot and Alan Freeman and a few others are still trying to hang on to it. It's wrong. About bloody time we admitted it. And there's others who did who do say it's wrong, of course, people like Aaron Bose with another great critique of, of Marx, uh, Marx's theory. But what did Marx advise? If you reckon somebody's made a mistake, what do you do? Well, this is Marx when he's a young man writing in his PhD thesis, talking about Hegel. It's conceivable that a philosopher could be guilty of this or that inconsistency because of this or that compromise. He may himself be conscious of it, and I think Marx was, and I'll show you why later. But what he is not conscious of is that in the last analysis, this apparent compromise is made possible by the deficiency of his principles or an inadequate grasp of them. So, if that's happened, it's the duty of his followers to using in the core of his logic to eliminate his own superficial expression of it. That's what I'm going to do. So if you go back to the dialectics, I might, I'm going to argue that it does both these things. Certainly a contradicts labour theory of value. It also allows for an energy-aware production function. But dialectics itself is a, a fraught area. I think I mentioned last week the best book I've seen on Marx's philosophy is called uh, Marx and Contradiction. By a guy called, I think it's Wild. Very, very good. Very short. Very, very good book. So I read that after I'd read Marx and worked out what I thought the dialectic was, and, and that particular very short book captured it extremely well. So he starts from saying that any component of a society is a social unity. In other words, you can't be disaggregated. Okay? You, ex you, are, you have an existence in your own right, but, but you must exist in a society at the same time. And you can only be understood from the social context in which you live. Now, the material forces of society will focus upon one aspect of that unity. If you imagine a feudal society, it would focus upon your social rank. Okay. Uh, but that pushes other aspects of the unity back into the background. If you focus on your social rank, you're ignoring that you might be a brilliant artist. Okay. Um, so the unity itself, even though one part is focused upon can't exist, which, which, which Marx calls the foreground, can't, be, can't exist without the background as well, even though it's being effectively ignored in society. So you get a tension between the foreground and the background, which Marx often calls its opposite, which develops the unity over time and can actually change society itself. Now, the way I represent this is a little graphic here. You may have the overall society in which we're, the unity we're looking at is embedded. The unity itself the stretch that society applies to it by focusing on a foreground aspect and ignoring a background, which still has to exist for the unity to exist overall. So there's a tension between the two. And I'm going to use that little model all the way through. So what you get out of this is a, this is a, I keep on coming back to this, it contradicts labour theory of value. It's compatible with, com with thermodynamics and complex systems. And it gives you multiple interacting price levels. One thing you can't get out of the neoclassical is anything other than the subjective pricing. Okay. 
out of the labor theory of value, you get objective pricing of everything. This gives you a match, a pattern of subjective and objective in different layers of uh, analysis, and it also structures the type of complex dynamics approach that I take to so cycles in capitalism and the distribution of income. Let's go through the labor theory of value stuff. So, in after he did his PhD, he'd become quite radicalized, and he was given he was, wasn't he, was, he wasn't given an academic post in Germany, even though he was the outstanding student. Everybody acknowledged him as the the brightest person in philosophy in Germany. He worked for a bunch of left wing papers instead and covered in the process of being effectively a journalist to the dispossession of peasants from the Black Forest, the beginning of the sort of enclosure movements that had happened in England beforehand. And he felt philosophy just didn't let him understand what the hell was going on. So he decided to study economics instead. He was expelled from Prussia to France. And while he was in France, living in a garret, he read the classical economist Smith, Ricardo, many others, Turgo, uh, Red Say as well, of course, um, and it's written up in what's called the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts, and he took copious notes on the way through. Okay, so that's that's the publication you need to look at. It's like having your notes for an essay published. Okay. Unprocessed views. And you can see that tended to develop I went through beforehand. Things with, uh, you know, uh, but when, when he's doing it, he's also clearly coming from his philosophical background. This is quite intriguing, what I want to focus upon here. Um, a lot of the stuff looks rather utilitarian here, but he's saying when Ricardo and Say are fighting over thrift versus luxury as the basis of a sound economy, he says there'll be no production without consumption. He says use determines the thing's value. Now, of course, that contradicts what he says later. Uh, fashion determines use. Extravagance and thrift, luxury and privation, wealth and poverty are equal. In other words, they're opposing elements of the same unity. And then he says, uh, when you again take a look at the philosophical phrasing of this as opposed to the much less philosophical writing that occurred between 18, 1846 and, and 1857. So it's an unmediated or mediated unity of the two. Capital labour first united, then separated and estranged, reciprocal, developed remote, positive conditions, to an opposition, excluding each other. That's the, that's the dialectical philosophy attempt to understand what he's reading of the classical economists. Now, I think you know, cap capital stored up labour, etc., etc. That you can see that what I'm really focusing on is the dialectical language that's being used here to try to understand the economics he's reading for the very first time. Clash of mutual contradictions. But over time, what, what you find happening in his writing, he really started to absorb Ricardo's way of thinking. He saw Ricardo as the clearest logic he'd read though he had not incomplete in various ways and he intended to, to replace Ricardo, but he saw himself as refining Ricardo using a, a measure of labor, labor as a measure of value, to saying labor is the only source of value. And he got this solution. How do you explain profit when all commodities are so purchased for their value and sold for their value? And you find him abandoning this dialectical method. And the interesting uh, the contrast in writing came when he attempted to explain to an anarchist called Proudhon. Ever heard his name? Okay, a fairly famous anarchist from the 19th century. He tried to explain to Proudhon, who was French, um, economics, political economy, having read the books himself for the first time. And at one stage, Marx said that his ambition in life was to combine German philosophy, English political economy, and French politics. Okay, that's what he was hoping he was going to do in France. Now, he attempted to explain it to Proudhon. And Proudhon completely mashed it up in what he called the philosophy of poverty. So Marx wrote a completely scatological reply called the poverty of philosophy. And this is Proudhon saying, the economists have very well explained the double character of value, what they haven't pointed out is a contradictory nature. Uh, it's a small matter to signal in utility value and exchange value. There's contrast, but he says, necessary to show this has a profound mystery, yada, yada, yada. In technical terms, use value and exchange value and inverse ratio, the one to the other. And where the more useful something is, the less it costs. That was Proudhon's attempt at dialectics. Now, Marx just thought this was a load of crap. And he was, Marx was a very polite man who really tried not to offend his, his opponents, not. So he went for the jugular and, then, and the, the uh, testicles at the same time. And he said he compared this language, this attempt at dialectical language by Proudhon, to uh, Ricardo. Look, this, and no, 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 there's a change in language in Marx right here. All that the philosophical expression is gone. It's much more a matter of fact English way of expressing 
his propositions. We will leave to the reader to compare the precise, clear and simple language of Ricardo with the rhetorical efforts made by Monsieur Proudhon in order to derive at the determination of relative value by labour time. Ricardo shows us the real movement of bourgeois production which constitutes value. Monsieur Proudhon makes abstraction of this movement, struggles to invent new processes in order to regulate the world according to a progressively new formula, which is only the theoretical existing ex expression of the, the real existing movement so well propounded by Ricardo, dumping on Proudhon big time. Ricardo takes for his point of departure existing society to demonstrate how to, it constitutes value. Mr. Proudhon takes for his point of departure constituted value in order to constitute a new social order by means of this. This is the punchline. The determination of value by labour time is for Ricardo the law of exchange value. For Monsieur Proudhon, it is the synthesis of use value and exchange value. Now, it's a big put down, okay, and justifiable, that particular contra contrast of intellects. But notice the final expression there, where that's going to turn back up again later on in Marx's logic. This is written in 1846. They're saying the synthesis of use value and exchange value, dismissing Proudhon on that front. But watch what happens. So Marx did accept this classical distinction between use value and exchange value of the commodity. And this is, I think, quoting from Smith here. The word value has two different meanings. Sometimes the utility of a particular object, sometimes the purchasing power of other goods. One may be called value and use, the other value and exchange. And then exchange value, according to the classical economists, was the sole determinative price, not use value. And this is, I think now, Ricardo, utility then is not the measure of exchangeable value, although it's absolutely essential to it. In other words, you can't sell something of it unless it has use value, but the use value itself doesn't determine the price. If a commodity were in no way useful, it would be devoid of exchange value, however scarce it might be, whatever quantity of labour took to make it, that's Ricardo. So Marx accepted that. And what they have is a focus upon long-term cost of production. If you look at the neoclassical theory, you know, supply and demand intersecting, intersecting line analysis, even their stuff argues that the ultimate price at level is the long-run cost of production, what of an average long and average cost curve. But that, this is the focus of, of Ricardo and Smith is on that point rather than the ups and downs of market price. So if you want to distinguish the classicals from the neoclassicals, you can say that the classicals had a focus upon long-run value, whereas the neoclassicals have a focus upon market value. Uh, now, this is, again, Ricardo being quite emphatic about it. It's the cost of production that ultimately regulates the price of commodities and not the proportion between supply and demand. Straight contract, contradiction of what you now get taught as, as gospel by neoclassicals. Diminish the cost of hats and their price will ultimately fall to their new natural price, even if demand doubles, trebles or quadruples. So, diminish the cost of subsistence of men and wages will ultimately fall notwithstanding an increase in the demand for labour. Now, Marx fully accepted that. And what Marx was saying in a Ricardian sense is use value is a prerequisite to exchange, but plays no role in setting the price. So it's qualitative, but objective. Okay, and since it's qualitative, the use value of the chairs you're sitting in is that you're not falling onto the floor. It's not how comfortable you feel in the chairs. Okay, it's an objective idea of utility, not the subjective neoclassical vision, which would be how comfortable does the chair make you feel. Okay, so it's, that's a, an important distinction, which I'll come back to later. But that's, that's the basic idea of utility in the classical school and, and, of course, in Marx. And the exchange value of two commodities is set by the labour time necessary for their production. What Marx did as an advance over Ricardo is explain how you get profit without violating the idea that things exchange at their values. So what he said was... Um, Ricardo starts from the actual facts. The value of labour is smaller than the value product it creates. Okay. The excess of surface value, it's a fact. How it remains, it remains unclear. The total working day is greater than the part required for the production of wages. Why? That doesn't emerge. This is actually after Marx has developed an alternative explanation, by the way. But this is his perspective. He provided the explanation that Ricardo didn't give. Now, Marx's explanation, which you can call a Ricardian one, but still con con um, based on this idea of the unique aspects of labour, uh, is the following, that profit arises because this unique attribute of labour, the difference between its cost of production, which is basically its means of subsistence, and the work it can do, which is labour. Okay. Again, if you think in the energy terms I gave you beforehand, cost of production is 2,000 calories a day. Okay. The amount of work you can do is 4,000 calories a day. Cost of production takes five hours to produce those goods. 
you work for 10 hours in a factory, that sort of thing. And here's Marx saying, worker received means of subsistence, but the capitalist receives labor, the productive activity of the worker, uh, which gives to the accumulated labor, in other words, capital, a greater value than it previously possessed. And this is very early, 1847, so it's back before a major change came through, as I'll show you in a moment. So this leads to the idea that because he's saying that labor is the only source of value, that gave you the tendency for the rate of profit to fall. Marx argued there was, as well as labor being the only source of value, and therefore the only genuine source of profit, that there was a tendency for capital machinery to be involved more over time, therefore the rate of profit had to fall. A tendency, the seven countervailing forces we talked about, but that was the fundamental direction he gave. And therefore an inevitability of crisis as the rate of profit fell, and socialism coming out of it well, but it also gave you the, the transformation problem. I, when I did my master's thesis, there was a, a well-known uh, Australian economist called Bruce McFarlane, an expert on Marx, a, a very good philosopher and historian of economic thought, and we bumped each other in the in the uh, mailroom and he said, oh, I said, I'm doing my thesis on Marx. He said, oh, the transformation problem. I said, no. He was shocked because almost every thesis on Marx was trying to solve the transformation problem. Now, it's terminal crisis for capitalism. We got a terminal crisis, crisis for socialism before we got here. And, of course, as I've mentioned, it conflicts with the laws of thermodynamics because labour can't produce a surplus without energy. And effectively, when I'm going to, as I've shown you a moment ago, the energy harnessed by capital is given no role in that theory in producing net work. But, and that's why I said that was all the worst of Marx you could throw him out. But Marx actually transcended that in 1857-58 when he had a chance rereading of a book by Hegel. I think it was Philosophy of Right. And, uh, oh, no, Physics of Right, so Hegel's Logic, pardon me. And what was happening was at this stage, Marx believed there was going to be a big revolution coming in uh, the very, very near future. So he went back to reread all the economics to provide the intellectual foundation for the revolution he thought was going to happen. And then I think it was Otto Breyer who dropped in one day to visit him in England and had, I think, actually Marx's old copy of Hegel's logic, gave it back to him. So Marx is reading all the economics by Ricardo Smith, all the various classical schools and so on. He's rereading Hegel as well. And you can see a substantial change coming in his writing. And this is a letter he wrote to Engels in uh, 1858, saying in the middle of writing it, he said that the method of treatment, the fact that by mere accident I've glanced through Hegel's logic and has been a great service to me. So the philosophy started coming back up again. Uh, and then what Mandel, who's another famous, uh, I don't imagine Mandel's still alive, but I don't really know. Um, Mandel said that there's an extraordinary richness of Marx's analysis after this point. Have you ever heard of a guy called Hunter S. Thompson? Nobody. Okay. Anybody read the Durnsbury cartoon? Ah, God, you guys are uneducated. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hunter S. Thompson was a police called famous gonzo journalist. And uh, he was he would he'd be popping pills all the way while he was writing his stories. And you'd actually read his passages and work out, okay, now he's now he's stoned. Now he's on cocaine, et cetera, et cetera. Marx, the change from when he did, when he went from abandoning his philosophy effectively and just working in Ricardian terms to after reading this is huge. And this is what Mandel's focusing on. All of a sudden, use value and exchange value, labor, time and leisure, labor and wealth, and which this book called The Grundrisse, which means rough draft, it was a rough draft of his uh, great grand manuscript, uh, must have been stimulated by his second encounter with his old mentor, Hegel. Now, the essence he had was this dialectical vision now applied now applied back to the commodity. So the commodity is the essential unity in capitalism. Uh, and capitalism focuses upon the exchange value of the commodity and the use value is less relevant. Okay. It has to have use value, but it's not what you focus upon. I'll give you my favourite uh, alternative example of that. In 1980-81, I took a tour of Australian journalists to China. And at this stage, when you took a tour of the... Of the um, to call the uh, forbidden, forbidden City, which is the heart of where the emperor used to live, they still had all the artworks in the Forbidden City. We walked past one object. One of my favourite objects was probably a, a, mount, a jade mountain, it's this carved lump of jade made to look like a mine where the jade workers were you know, pulling wheels, carts with jade in it, out of the mountain. That piece of jade was about seven metres tall. Yeah. But my favourite object was this strange shape thing. It looked like 
like an up, like look like a fist, you know, that sort of shape. Okay? And what it has is this is all gold. It had a bit of a handle thing down here. This was studded with, with giant rubies, emeralds, diamonds, unbelievable amount of jewellery. And the the the, the uh, one of the journalists came up to me and said, "Steve, what do you think it is?" I said, "It's obvious, Jane. It's a back scratcher." Ha ha ha! I walked away. She caught up with me about 15 minutes later and said, I asked, it is a back scratcher. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, of course, in a feudal society, you focus upon the utility. Okay? In a capitalist economy, you're focused upon the exchange value. You want to buy a back scratcher, you go down to Sainsbury's and buy it for 50p. Okay? So exchange value determines price. Use value is irrelevant. And that transforms Ricardo's long-run cost of production into an explanation for why the price of production, why production costs set price, uh, because both the foreground and the background aspects are, are vital. The commodity can't exist without having use value as well as exchange value. So there's a tension between use value and exchange value. Remember that synthesis thing I pointed out earlier? His jibe at, at, um, at um, Proudhon. This now turns up in the, in the Grundrisse. Now, the Grundrisse, again, a bit like the... Uh, uh, economic and philosophical manuscripts, was Marx's handwritten notes as he read through all the texts he was reading in the British Library. I've got to go to the British Library and sit in his seat one day. Still haven't done that, nor have I been to his grave. It's big oversight, so I'm mean, to make amends this year. Um, so what you get is just handwritten notes, and at one point there's a footnote in the published version of this which goes on for one and a half pages. Now, it wasn't a footnote. It was something where Marx, bang, 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 bang emphasis, like you know, double asterisks either side or whatever to emphasise, underlining and saying, this is, this is when he first realised, having read Hegel, going back to the whole idea of the use value and exchange value of a commodity, suddenly he says this, is not value to be conceived as the unity of use value and exchange value? In and for itself, is value the general form with use value and exchange value particular forms of it? So value is the unity, use value and exchange value are the background and foreground. Does this have significance in economics? Okay. He's really saying, holy shit, I've discovered something here. Use value is presupposed even in simple exchange or data, but here, where it just takes for a reciprocal exchange of use values, the nature of the commodity has no particular standing. What he's saying, if you imagine primitive tribes meeting up on boundaries, one might be able to make white leather, the other might be able to make pottery. They make an exchange of the two because they want the utility that comes with the object and the price is irrelevant. The, the, the cost of production is irrelevant to setting the price. So it's form as exchange value. Uh, so in this case, use value is not part of the social relation. But he continues, does thus this content develop into a system of needs and production when you start looking now at, a, at a, you know, a large capitalist economy, does not use value enter into the form itself uh, as a determinant, for example, in the relation of capital and labour. If only exchange value plays a role in economics, then how could later elements enter which relate purely to use value? He really is playing with intellectual concept he's just discovered. Price is merely a formal aspect, and he said this is not in the slightest contradicted by exchange value as the predominant aspect. Exchange value in the foreground, use value in the background. Pardon me, wrong mouse movement then. Is it? But of course, um, the, the use value doesn't come to a halt just because exchange sets price. Uh, in this, and now notice here he comes back to say, talking about say as well, but he also talks about Proudhon. And, uh, this has to be examined in exactitude not be entirely abstracted upon, Ricardo never considered use value, nor the dull say, puffing him up with mere, mere use of the word utility, and then it must become clear to the extent to which use value exists, not only as presupposition to enable to exchange to occur, but to what extent it's part of economics. And then, then Proudhon's nonsense, Sigmund Mazzari, poverty of philosophy, the philosophy of poverty. So this is a huge revelation for Marx, and he now starts to rethink how he derived all these basic concepts. And from that point on, that idea of a dialectic between use value and exchange value became the fundamental um, purpose of way of his thinking. And we have his own words on this front because sometime, I've forgotten how long after, after he died, but somebody found a copy of a book by Adolf Wagner critiquing Marx's capital. And the notes you've made that, that, that Marx made in the margin were transcribed and became a, 
a little pamphlet called Marginal Notes on Alfred Wagner. And what you find is there's a the blend of dialectics and classical economics now, but dialectics is definitely the foundation. I think it's about time I gave you guys a break. Make a point of that sort of point? Yep. Okay. Now, again, this is some of the dialectical pairs that Marx is putting together there. And he's saying, um, when he's talking about simple circulation, exchanging one commodity for another, you can't say that there's a, a, it's realised in simple, in simple circulation, but what you get is an opposition between exchange value and use value. Uh, is it, it's all about the commodity in capitalism leading to this being an important distinction. Um, it's just a use value becomes what it is through exchange value. Exchange value mediates itself through use value. This is all strongly you're now using his, for a long time, abandoned Hegelian logic as part of driving his economics. And my visual models I've shown you a moment ago, now looking at the commodity in this particular case, is that this society itself, capitalist society now, specify what it is, the commodity sees as the central unity in capitalism. Capitalism focuses upon the exchange value and that therefore sets the price. The use value is irrelevant to price, but there's now a tension between the two. And that tension he uses to explain where surplus value comes from. Uh, now, before... Where is he? Yeah. So if you look at his analysis beforehand, you can pretty much say he had half the circle. Half the circle, not the entire thing, because... All he focused upon, and all Smith and Ricardo focused upon, was the exchange value of the commodity. Okay? Saying the use value has to be there, but it plays no role in the economics. So exchange value was everything. Use value was necessary, but otherwise irrelevant. Whereas what Marx said after this was say, we've got to look at the whole thing. Exchange value, use value, and the tension between them. And that's what he saw as the key to understanding capitalism. And he wrote that phrase at the end of the of Grundrisse itself, which then became prelude to writing... Uh, capital. Uh, so it's a fundamentally different view that the neoclassicals have about the role that utility has in setting price. And he gives it a historical and evolutionary explanation for how this came about because he said if you imagine some primitive society um, that when exchange occurs between two different primitive societies, they will have no idea how something was made, no idea of the amount of cost involved and will exchange for the utility they perceive the thing happening. So he says, you start off with this idea that uh, you have a tacit understanding to treat objects as being alienable so you can give them away, because there are some societies where that doesn't apply. Um, he said that has no existence in a primitive society based on property in common. You can't give away what doesn't belong to you, which belongs to the community instead. Um, but if you look at uh, in, in those societies, you say, well, exchange is going to happen on the border, borders between these two societies. So initially when that happens... Uh, there'll be points of contact, and once commodities start become produced, not, not for occasional exchange, but for regular exchange. And my, again, my best favourite example here is the uh, the uh, Indians on Manhattan Island selling Manhattan Island for forty gold for 40, 40 glass beads. Why? Because their society couldn't make glass beads. Okay. That's whether the story is true or not. I don't know. But that's the basic idea. They were willing to sell the island of Manhattan for 40 glass beads. They were actually trading beads, as it happens. It's a slightly more complicated story. He said, once you start producing commodities not for your own use and then trading them when you come into contact, but actually literally making them so you can exchange, he said the proportions, at least the proportions, start off being a matter of chance. But as you start doing this regular exchange, repetition, and you start to get some sense of knowledge of the distinct, of the, of the, cost of production involved, um, you start with, you start for a while, you're producing these goods now, not for your own consumption, but with a view to selling them. Okay. So you've, you're the tribe that can make white leather. You're producing additional white leather because you want to exchange it for pots with the tribe that can produce pots, that sort of thing. And so at this point, you get a distinction between the use value of the commodity and its exchange value. So he's saying a primitive society might behave the way neoclassicals think capitalism does, taking the utility into account and setting the price. But if you live in a society where you're actually making lots and lots of these things for sale, the utility of the object being produced is irrelevant to the seller. Okay. Buyer, of course, is relevant. But, and my, again, my favourite example here, I don't think 
According to neoclassical theory, every time Henry Ford sold a Model T, he had a drop in his utility level. I don't think so. Okay? It's a vision for a prim exchange between primitive societies who don't know how things are produced rather than where you've a capitalist society where you're mass producing and you, you couldn't give a shit about what you're selling from your point of view. Your utility, you only produce it, you, only utility has for you is producing for sale. Now, it then comes back to the whole question of where does surplus come from? And there's now a very, very different method of what he used in the original Ricardian idea because he's not only talking about what's unique about labour. He's now talking about what labour shares in common with every other object, and that's the dialectic between use value and exchange value. So he starts by saying if equivalents are exchanged, then exchange of the commodity itself, the exchange value, can't be the source of surplus. You've got one commodity you're exchanging for another, exchange value itself can't be the source. Therefore, the dialectical opposite, use value, is the only possible source of surplus value. And he's talking about how do you make money on the, what we call the MCM plus circuit. Okay. So the change in value, how does a capitalist take money and, and generate more money? How does capitalists make a profit? So the change in value must take in place in the commodity bought by the first act. Money, you buy money, if you use money, you buy a commodity with it. But it can't be in terms of the exchange value because you're paying full price for it. You're not going to make a profit when you're paying full price. He said, we are therefore forced to the conclusion that change, source of surplus value, originates in the use value of the commodity, its consumption. In order to be able to extract value from consumption of a commodity, our friend money bags must be so lucky as to find a commodity whose use value because it's a peculiar property of being a source of value. And saying it's peculiar, but he's now working in general terms of use value and exchange value rather than what's unique about labour itself. And what he says here, and I'm going to highlight this in various ways, this is in capital now. The past labour embodied in labour power and the living labour it can call into action are two totally different things. The former determines the exchange value, the latter is its use value. And so the fact that during a, a, the half working days is necessary to keep the labourer alive for 24 hours does not prevent him working for a whole day. Therefore the value of labour power and the value it creates are two entirely different magnitudes, and that's why the capitalist hired the worker. The useful qualities of that doesn't particularly matter. The fact that somebody's a seamstress or a boot maker and how good they are doesn't matter. It's just the gap between the use value and the exchange value of having bought their labour. And then he says, what really influences him is the specific use value that this commodity possesses of being a source not only of value, but more value it has itself. And then this is, a, again, at this stage, he's using a general logic to derive a specific conclusion about labour. So he's saying here, um, the, the, what the capitalist is doing is doing what everybody buy, does when they buy a commodity. They, they, um, the seller of labour power, like the seller of any other commodity, so it's no longer something unique about labour, realises its exchange value and parts with its use value. He said that is a complete change in logic, and I'm afraid most Marxists don't get it. Um, um, they've ignored use value completely. Now, my favourite example here is Paul Sweezy, because he just used this set of lines in his, I think I've forgotten what the book is called, Theory of Capitalist Development, I think. He said every, in dismissing use value from Marxist logic, he said every commodity Marx wrote is a twofold aspect, that of use value and exchange value. Uh, there's nothing peculiar about having use value. Everything, any whoever consumes always have a use value. Use value is a relationship between the consumer and the object. Uh, political economy is a relationship between people. It follows that use value, and this is now a quote, use value as such lies outside the sphere of investigation of political economy. And most Marxists swallow this stuff um, when they were uh, reading their Marx. Now, that's not what Marx said. It's quite, quite amazing when I found it. I wrote to Sweezy about it and got a very negative reply back, which is what I expected. But when you make a quote, and you should do this in your own writing as well, if you leave out the phrase, you put epaulets in there, triple dots. Okay? He left out two phrases without epaulets in the middle of the text, and he also um, left out a sentence. And the first person to point this out in publication was a guy called Ross Dolsky. Uh, and this is, um, if you look in, looking in Marx's comments, this is quoting Ross now, if you look in Marx's comments on... Ricardo, in the rough draft or Grundrisse, he's accusing Ricardo of abstracting from use value and saying that it lies as a, as a pre-proposition. He said, well, there's a tradition for Marxists to also disregard use value. 
in that sense, they're disregarding a huge part of Marx's logic. Now, this is Marx as written rather than Marx as quoted by Squeezy. To be a use value, it's a prerequisite. Use value is such, since it is independent of the determined economic form, that's what was left out by Squeezy, lies outside the sphere of the investigation of political economy. It belongs in this sphere when it's a determinant form. Why would you use someone's Pardon? Because if he didn't leave it out, he'd have to take it seriously and he didn't want to. It was very, I mean, that's bad. That is a very bad scholarship. That's not what you would call it. That's not what a scholar does. Now, when you look in Marx, Marx's own comments about people leaving use value out, you can find it on these Marshall notes on, uh, in Wagner. And he says, only an obscurantist who has not understood a word of capital conclude because Marx in a note to the first edition of capital, it's a... Um, a um, that's a particular small um, pre, pre-book to capital, uh, overthrows all German professorial twaddle and refuse, refers readers to, to, to commercial guides. Therefore, Yusufo does not play any role in his work. Uh, he's overlooked that my analysis doesn't stop at the dual mode of the commodity, but presses on to the twofold character, useful labour, uh, abstract labour, etc., etc. Surplus value is derived from the specific use of labour power that belongs to it exclusively. Hence, use value plays an important role, completely different than it did in previous political economy. So Marx is saying, if you ignore use value in exchange for this dialectic, you're not understanding my logic. Okay. But that's what the vast majority of Marxists have done, including modern ones who are trying to defend a labour theory of value. Now, when you start thinking, pardon me, when you start thinking about the role of use value in this, in this. Um, way he juxtaposes with exchange value. When you're looking at use value and consumption, the use value of something is qualitative. Okay? Again, the use value of those chairs, you can sit in it. You sit in them, you're not lying on the floor. That's an objective use value. Uh, but it's a qualitative one. But when you look at it from the point of view of capitalists buying commodities, the use value they're looking for is a quantitative. Look at this passage I showed you beforehand. It said, the past labour embodied in labour power and the living labour can call into action, etc., etc. said the former determines exchange value. What's the former? It's the past labour. It's the subsistence going in there. The use value is the living labour can call into action. They're both measured in number of hours. Okay. They're, so the use value here is quantitative. And again, most Marxists can't get their head around that. So you get the specific use value of being a source of more value than it's got itself, quantitative. In Capital Volume One, okay, it's amazing what people have to ignore, not to see this sort of stuff. But they trying. I mean, a lot of people who read Marx, as as Aaron Bose put it, read Marx in a religious fashion. Okay, when the when the words and the logic contradict, go with the words. He said we should go with the logic, not with the words. So what he's saying here is exchange value and use value and magnitudes in the circuit of capital, the way the capitalists make a profit. The labour value, which is the exchange value, and the labour power, which is the use value, are two entirely different, and he does say the word magnitudes. And that difference, so it's a, it's a, but by saying exchange value and use value are unrelated, they can be different. Okay. Because they're different and they're both quantitative, there'll be a physical surplus between the two. So that um, the actual usefulness of the labour itself in terms of making yarn or boots, is just a condition. It's not. It's not. Not. It's something which matters for the actual capitalist himself. And then when he's talking about exchange value and use value, again he does say being intrinsically incommensurable magnitudes. Now I can show this stuff, and I did show it, of course, to my examiners. I was blue in the face, and they could not accept that use value was mag- was quantitative. Under what basis is a use value is, is, a, is a qualitative thing a magnitude? So it's it's there in Marx's logic. Um, and what, so what he's saying here is that the, the nature of use value depends upon the search you're looking at. If you're looking at where people are selling the commodity labour to get a wage and buy goods and good services afterwards, not making a profit out of it, then the use value is qualitative. You go, and, you go to Tesco's to buy food to stay alive. Okay? It's a qualitative thing. Uh, but in the MCM plus circuit where capitalists are making a profit, the use value is quantitative and it plays a role in capitalism. And the most essential role is explaining where surplus comes from. So here's Marx's explanation now on that uh, little diagram of mine. You have the MCM plus circuit, 
labor as your commodity, focusing them on the foreground, the exchange value of labor, that gives you the subsistence wage. The background is its use value, which is its capacity to produce commodities for sale. The tension between the two is there's going to be a gap, and that's the source of profit from labor. Now, when you bring in um, the same thing with the energy aware production function I'm talking about, you get exactly the same thing without the spelling mistakes I can now see that I've made in that particular passage. Pardon me, I'll pick them up. Okay, and I didn't animate that one properly either, so let's do that. Okay, pardon me. Go back to the slideshow. Now, what he's looking at, and the, I'm hammering this because it is such an important distinction with mainstream interpretations of Marx. By mainstream, I now mean the true believers of Marx and also the people who think they've dismissed Marx by seeing through the holes in his logic, which were holes in the labour theory of value logic, not this dialectical stuff. So he's saying the new product includes uh, the value of labour power together with the surplus value, um, and that's because the value of labour power of a definite length of time is less than the value created during that time. So the worker has received payment for the exchange value of his labour power and has alienated his use value, this being the case in every sale and purchase. So again, rather than focusing upon the unique aspects of labour, it's now what labour shares in common with every commodity. Now that starts to generate a bit of a dilemma here, uh, and I'll show you in a moment on that, because how does that apply to machinery? But here he's saying the fact that it... This commodity, labour power, has the use value of supplying labour and creating value, can't affect the general law of exchange. Um, is the, the, the magnitude of value advanced the wage is found not merely found again in the product, but is found augmented by a surplus value, not because the seller's being defrauded. Okay, again, Marx is not the old-fashioned Ricardian socialist saying workers are ripped off. He's received the value. He's been paid the exchange value of his commodity. The buyer has used the use value. And you, uh, you said you, what you require is a quality between the exchange values and the commodities. For the very outset, it presumes a difference in their use values. Now, again, we're coming back to this idea of it being quantitative. And the, the source of surplus is the use value of whatever has been purchased, not the exchange value. So what about a machine? <coughs> okay. Isn't it going to have a use value that differs from an exchange value? And therefore, shouldn't commodity inputs also be sources of value? And that's Marx and his, his uh, so-called supporters these days argued no, but they twisted this logic just totally to reach this. And what you'll find is the basic logic to say the exchange value of the machine is the cost of production, the use value is the ability to produce commodities in, uh, in, 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 using the machine. There's going to be a gap between the use value and the exchange value, so the machine can be a source of surplus value. And when I include energy in there as well, the raw materials you're getting from the real world. So it contradicts the labour theory of value. All inputs to production of potential sources of profit. The contribution of the machine will exceed depreciation. And Marx actually realised that when he first started writing this down. When he's first playing with the idea, back in the Grundrisse, this is where I think he suddenly realised, holy shit, I've contradicted myself here. How the fuck, pardon the French, do I get out of this? Yeah. So he said, it all has to be postulated, the use value of the machine significantly greater than its value i.e. its devaluation of the service of, service of production is not proportional to its increasing effect upon production. But I'm pretty certain at that moment, Marx, Marx's mind would have gone, if that's true, then increasing the amount of machinery is not going to reduce the rate of profit, so there won't necessarily be a tendency for the rate of profit to fall, and socialism is no longer inevitable. Can't have that. How can I fudge myself back to get back to the original conclusion? And that's what you start finding, an enormous amount of fudging. So he's seeing himself as transcending Ricardo now. He's got an explanation for something that Ricardo could never explain properly, which is, first of all, the primacy of cost of production over utility in setting price. Uh, and the first uh, concrete step in doing this was to say, what is the opposite? This is the whole idea of foreground and background. What do you put as the opposite of capital? And this is, again, extremely... Again, a very philosophical way of stating it, just back to Hegel again, but it shows how wrong it is to say that machinery cannot contribute to value. The only utility which an object can have for capital is to increase or preserve it. Okay. The only usefulness that can stand opposite capital is something which multiplies and preserves capital. 
So the opposite of capital cannot be a particular commodity. That wouldn't be an opposition to capital. Since the substance of capital itself is use value, it's not this commodity or that commodity, but all commodities. And what he's saying is, again, not just labour on its own. But then, how does he get out of it? He then says, uh, the common substance is the fact that they're objectified labour. That's what they've all got in common. That contradicts the idea that the opposite can't be a particular commodity. He said it's all commodities and therefore it's just one, labour. And you can see this pattern throughout his logic from this stage on. He, he starts using this use value and exchange value um, to get the source of surplus using a rule that applies to all commodities, but he, he obfuscates and confuses when he's considering machinery. And this was enough to confuse one and a half centuries of Marxists. So he says that he's gone from saying it's about the unique characteristics of labour to the characteristics labour has in common with all other commodities. The worker sells his commodity, which has a use value, and as a commodity, also a price, like all other commodities. Okay? The capitalist attains labour. Okay? Um, so that's he's very comfortable in using it when he's talking about labour because it reaches the conclusion he wants to reach. Uh, and it's tied up in this whole idea of different circuits as well. So commodity, money, circuit, commodity, there's no, um, no profit made there because you're buying something for its use value. MCM plus, it does matter because your use value you're looking for is, is quantitative. So in simple circulation, you go from a commodity to money to commodity. The sole object is to go from one commodity that gives you no utility to one that gives you more utility. Your own labour, capacity to work, is no use to you unless you can turn it into food, a means of subsistence. So in that sense, you're swapping a low, for you, low utility for a high utility outcome. So far as use values go, it's clear that both gain an advantage. So Marx is not saying there's no utility motivation in people uh, buying and selling. The circuit of capital, you're going from money to commodity to more commodity, the sole objective is to increase exchange value, monetary value. Uh, but it can't occur when you're exchanging equivalents. It must be the use value that explains where that comes from. So when you're looking at simple circulation, the using up of the commodity is purely physical interest. That belongs outside economics, therefore use value in that circuit is irrelevant. Uh, but use value is exchange for money is a particular economic relation. And there's a distinction between the forms of exchanges. CMC is very different to MCM plus, the motivation behind the term. So, so, so far as use values, because most, most parties gain an advantage, uh, they part with goods that have no service to them and receive others they can make use of. So it's true to say that exchange is a transaction by which both sides gain. Again, a lot of Marxists don't realise Marx says things like that, but it's in this context. But others for exchange value, the act of exchanging one commodity for another in that circuit generates no surplus. Okay. So the key advantage he's got is that surplus value arises out of the use value of labour, and that's something we didn't get in Ricardo because Ricardo didn't talk at all about use value except to dismiss it in setting price. Um, so I was the first to point out and examine this twofold nature of labour, and this is a pivot on which a clear comprehension of political economy turns. So we've got to go into more detail on he goes. This is in, in capital now. So profit has to be explained on the basis of exchanging equivalents. Uh, I said in order uh, that the conversion of money into capital has to be explained on the basis that you sell something for its cost of production and you buy something for its cost of production. And then he applies it very soundly to labour. This is the statement here. Again, putting it in my little terms. You've got the MCM circuit. Here's machinery. The foreground is the exchange value determines the machine price. The background is the capacity to produce certain commodities for sale. The tension between the two, this is a source of surplus, which is not what Marx concludes. So exactly the same logic applied to labour machinery as labour gives you the same result. Machinery can produce a surplus. And we've seen from a thermodynamical point of view, because a machine is another way to harness free energy. We're trying to do work, useful work. Both machines and labour can, can do that. Marx stuffs it up completely. And the huge amount of verbal gymnastics designed there to, to confuse people, including Marx was trying to confuse himself. And I think he ultimately succeeded. So he starts to use these unique attributes of labour in a very negative way. He says this difference between labour and labour power is unique to labour. Surplus arises because of this exchange value of labour and the, um, and the use value. But there's no such difference for machines. 
therefore you can ignore it. The earlier logic, in other words, when he's talking on the unique aspects of labor, on that basis you could reject capital. There's nothing, the same unique thing doesn't apply to capital. You don't have machine and machine power. You buy the machine, you own the machine. When you buy a worker, you don't own the worker. Okay, So that, that's the distinction Marx was working off. When he goes over to talking about the general characteristics of commodities, he can't be done. But there's a total verbal barrage that confuses, Marx it deliberately confuses Marx and also confuses a lot of Marxists. The means of production transfer their value to the, only so far as they, with their use value, they lose their exchange value. Now, it's true a machine depreciates in production. What he's trying to say is depreciation is exactly equal to its contribution to production. Um, so what do they contribute? Their exchange value, their use value. And this, this is how, I mean, there's a lot of, I'll put these slides up on study space. I'm sorry I haven't done that so far. You can take a look at the logic in detail there. But here he's saying that uh, when you have a machine, when something is being used, its use value is completely consumed and therefore its exchange value completely transferred to the product. Both those statements are true. Okay. Exchange value is part of cost of production. What about the use value? What Marx ultimately comes back to saying is the use value of the machine is precisely equal to its exchange value, which is wrong, according to his own logic. So, so you know how long a machine will last. Suppose it lasts six days. It transfers one-sixth of its use value and therefore parts one-sixth of its value to the product. Uh, the means of production uh, never transfer more value than they lose themselves. And that's what he's now making equating the use value to the exchange value of the machine, which contradicts his own logic. So they're losing the labour form in the form of another use value. Here he's talking about qualitative transmission of value. There's a lot of crap in there trying to defend an idea which is fundamentally wrong. So he says the maximum level of loss is limited by the labour time necessary for production. Therefore, they can never add more than they possessed independently in the first place, however useful the machine, and there's that statement I showed you beforehand. But it's all obfuscating his logic rather than employing the logic because if he employed the logic properly, he would have eliminated the argument that socialism is inevitable, which he wanted to hang on to. So lots of logic. I go, go through more detail in, in my in the um, papers I've, I've linked to you there. For, but he's putting down his own logic to hang on to the conclusion he wanted to reach. And on it goes. Um, uh, he's, what he's doing is equating the use value of the machine to its exchange value. When he started by saying they're incommensurable, they're going to be different. So you get a mess there, and that mess has enabled people to hang on to the labour theory of value, despite the fact that Marx found them, gave them a way to liberate themselves from it. So he talks about constant capital. That's why he uses C, because he says the value of capital is not increased. Uh, v for, use V for variable because he says that does increase it. Um, all logical errors, which kept people believing to be a Marxist, you've got to believe the labour theory of value. Um, so... He's contradicting his own logic to hang on to that desired conclusion. And um, but here, when he when he's when he's free of this, then he states that his logic very emphatically: its use value, which therefore has nothing to do with its exchange value, is the energy which creates exchange value. That's the general law. So he should have applied that to machinery. He didn't, and we got the mess that's the labour theory of value, and we got frankly socialism out of it as well. So use value has nothing to do with its exchange value. But in the machine, he's arguing they're equivalent to each other. So you end up undermining his own logic if you hang on with that. And there was one Marxist who realised this was a problem. Magnet, he's now Lord Magnat decide, by the way. He's one of the Labour Lords. Um, but what he did to, to hang on to Marx's conclusion, he contradicted a major part of his own logic. So he starts in the use value and exchange value stuff. Uh, but he says that... When you look at exchange between worker and capitalist, there's a power relation. So this looks this like so far it looks identical to Marx. The gap between exchange value and use value exactly Marx's logic at this point. But how does he say machines don't produce surplus value? He uses unequal exchange here and says um, there's an unequal exchange in the market for labour between the worker and the capitalist. The capitalist is much more powerful. Um, he said, on the other hand, machines and raw materials are sold by capitalists and bought by capitalists, so therefore you can't exploit surplus because there's no longer a power relation to let you do that. 
So labor is the one commodity sold by the worker and bought by the capitalist. That's the way he hang on to the labor theory of value. But that contradicts Marx's arguments about the laws of exchange. And this is Marx, and many, many times will say something of this nature. A worker who buys a commodity for three shillings appears to the seller in the same fashion as a king who does the same. In other words, you, you can't use a power relation to explain where this surplus came from. You've got to presume unequal exchange in the marketplace. And I just love uh, this next statement here. To explain the general nature of profits, you must start from the theorem that commodities are sold at their real values and profits are derived by selling them at their real values. Uh, if you cannot explain profit upon this opposition, you cannot explain it at all. So even though Desai thinks he managed to hang on to both Marx's logic, use value, exchange value, and the labour theory of value, he's undermining the central part of Marx's argument that you can't use power relations to explain the price difference. So they will exist, okay? But if that's the only way you can explain profit, according to Marx, big deal. You haven't really explained it. So that's uh, the labour theory of value, therefore, is not necessarily part of the classical school of economic thought. And this is why I want to spend so much time on this. We think we need to go back to the classical school, which is far more realistic than the neoclassical school. But we don't want to go back there with the labour theory of value. And it's possible to go back without the labour theory of value and get this whole dialectic that Marx gave us of the use value and exchange value is the underlying way of thinking about capitalism and the two circuits of, of CMC, MCM plus and capitalists making a profit from the quantitative difference between the exchange values and the use values of the inputs they buy to production. And labour is not privileged in this basis. It's, as I've shown you, it's actually energy for uh, machinery that's the main source of this. Uh, so there's no input privilege over any other input in producing a surplus, but it's now consistent with this idea of thermodynamics that you're actually exploiting free energy to make that profit. And um, again... A lot of Serafians, a lot of post Keynesian just ignore where surplus comes from and just say that produces it, let's leave it alone. I don't think that will ever give post Keynesians or, or Serafians almost died out now. It won't give them a pedagogical alternative to the neoclassical use value, utility, you know, marginal cost and marginal revenue, marginal utility and marginal cost. That's an organising framework of people's minds that enables them to build an overall superstructure starting from a set of shared concepts. Now, because the post-Keynesian school hasn't had that, you haven't had that development of a cohesive alternative to the neoclassicals. And they won't go near Marx because of the labour theory of value and all that sort of stuff. But I think this gives me a positive way to build a non-neoclassical approach to economics. And this is coming back to the point you and I were talking about in the break. It enables you to elaborate the further complexities and they include, for example, that wages exceed subsistence. Okay. The wage is not subsistence, it's above subsistence. You get subjective pricing of money, capital assets and new commodities, etc., etc. Now let's um, take another bit of a break and I'll go into the final part of that after about 10 minutes for that all to sink in. So... What you find in Marx is not just this explanation for, the, for where surplus comes from, but a whole range of additional ways of expanding the analysis. And you get multiple independent price levels and multiple levels where sometimes subjective valuations determine prices, other times where objective do as well. So looking at wages, most Marxists assume that the value of labour power is the subsistence wage. When you look at Marx... There's seven occasions on which he describes the value of labour power in relation to the wage. Every single time he says the value of labour is the minimum wage. Okay. Uh, so we've got some exact excerpts here. For the time being, necessary labour supposes such, i.e. workers only obtain the minimum of wages. Um, he said, all these fixed suppositions become fluid in the further course of development. In other words, this is a starting assumption. And we get looking at Cabin in a more elaborate way, we'll... Uh, drop the assumption, which he had in Volume 1 of Capital, that the wage is the value of labour power. Uh, the, the, the value of labour power is the, is the subsistence wage. So the natural price of labour is nothing but the minimum wage. The value of labour power is the people, minimum of wages. Minimum wage, alias. Okay, Can you be more emphatic than that? There's seven occasions I found in his writings over time. So how can you be arguing that the value of labour power is the minimum wage 
and be consistent with the theory of value that he uses. We get, another, you get a dialectic again on top of the commodity dialectic. You now get a labor dialectic, which the worker is both a commodity and a non-commodity. If you're a commodity, when somebody hired you, they put you on a shelf at night, okay? which they don't do. So capitalism focuses upon the commodity aspect, pushes the non-commodity into the background. If you're treated as a pure commodity, all you get is a subsistence wage. The non-commodity side of you demands a share in the surplus. So therefore you get a dialectical tension between the two, which gives you a struggle over the minimum wage, pressure of social wage, even basic income guarantee and things of that nature. So normally the wage is going to be greater than subsistence. And only when you're going to be treated as absolutely reduced to being no more than a commodity will the wage just be a subsistence wage. And so what you get out of that is income distribution dynamics become an essential part of capitalism. And again, putting that in this uh, little graphic of mine, you have capitalist society. Labor is now your unity you're looking at. The foreground is you pay the subsistence wage. The background is you're a non-commodity, you're going to organise, you're going to demand a share in the surplus, push for social wages and so on. And the tension between the two means that the wage, the minimum wage, uh, the subsistence will be the minimum wage. Normally you're going to get above that and there's going to be dynamics, conflict dynamics over the distribution of income coming out of that. And now what you get is the difference between labour and labour power no longer explains where surplus comes from, it explains why the value of labour power is the minimum wage. A big inversion in how Marx uses his logic. So he's quite happy to say workers receive more than the value of labour power and, and they also will demand a share in the surplus and therefore you're going to get these income distribution dynamics. Now one intriguing thing was that I no longer get time to referee. I, I just basically ignore requests to referee papers these days. I'm too bloody busy. Back when I used to, I got a request to referee this paper done by some, math some mathematical physicists, the physics department of Duke University, Electrical Engineering and Mathematics Department of University um, United States Army Research Office, those are where the authors are from. And it's called an Out of Equilibrium Model of Distribution of Wealth. And what they found was they were trying to fit the distribution of income to a couple of mathematical functions. And they had one function based on wealth and another based on trade. They found the only way they could fit the data was to presume that in trade, the people who were selling got more than their value. And even though I knew this was part of Marx at the time, I got a bit of a surprise. But I then looked at it and thought, well, in fact, now I see what they're actually done. They've uncovered this particular facet of capitalism that Marx was talking about. Of course, this is also compatible with the energy theory of production because workers are sharing and the useful work done primarily by machines. So that's a major energy we harness to do useful work in modern society. So what they said was, and this is the physicist's A paper, we attempt to replicate the empirical distribution of wealth using a model in which there are two ways you're going to accumulate wealth, by investment and by trading. Uh, by investment, something which creates or destroys wealth. So by trading, any type of transaction, so, uh, they had a non, they were using a, you know, quite complicated mathematics, non-linear stochastic trade mechanism. They said all trades, in a trade there may be a transfer of wealth from one agent to another because the price fluctuates around an equilibrium. So the, value, the price may differ from the value. Again, this is very non-neoclassical thinking and very good empirical work. He said, in a trade, the amount of wealth that may move from one agent to another is bounded by the price and the value. The, the value of the commodity cannot usually exceed the wealth of the poorer of the two traders. So a person who's really poor can't pay more than their wealth to buy something. So when they try to jiggle this distribution, and notice here they're talking about trade which actually transfers wealth. But if you look at Volrav, Volrav, or Volrav again, the neoclassical general equilibrium approach, Volrav was trying to work out how trade could occur in such a way there was no transfer of wealth. You would only allow trade to occur in equilibrium. Now, what they're losing is all the stuff these physicists are now finding later, where you actually allow um, transfer of wealth to occur in trade. And they said the price is socially determined in such a way that the trade is statistically based biased in favour of the poorer trader. Now, you wouldn't expect that, would you? And standard thinking about capitalism, but in fact, it's consistent with Marx. Now, when I, when I did my referees report, I wrote back saying, well, here's, you know, I was, I was amazed by your result, even though I knew in, in, inherently in myself I should have known that you'd find something like this. Uh, but here's the work in Marx that supports your argument that the worker gets more, most of the time, gets more than the value of what they're selling. 
And so they quoted Marx with the quotes I gave them. They said, in his complete analysis, Marx made clear the wage would normally exceed the value of labour power because the natural price is nothing but the minimum wage, which is the subsistence payment. So that there should be a bias in favour of workers because they don't just receive the subsistence payment. So the price, the wage, should normally exceed the wage value. And again, what you find in Marx occasionally is if you don't understand this distinction between use value and exchange value, and also that Marx saw the value of wages as a minimum, you can't explain things like this chapter, well, volume, volume 1, chapter 25 model, which comes out of the blue, where Marx starts talking about how you can get cycles in capitalism. And he says, talking about how accumulation, growth in the economy, can slacken because labor, the price of labor rises. That reduces the rate of accumulation, but you then get less investment effectively turning up. That means that the rate of growth of the economy falls, so employment falls. Price of labor again falls to the level at which you can get an expansion of capital, so capital start investing once more. And this is, we know that Marx spent most of his post-capital period trying to understand um, mathematics so he could put this into a model. He never managed to do it, but yet actually Marx's manuscripts on calculus are quite an interesting read. But he said to put it mathematically, the rate of accumulation is the independent variable. In other words, the rate of profit is what sets the outcome. The rate of wages is dependent. So profit and investment drive the value of the wage, not the other way around. Now, when you get this idea of a surplus value um, being generated in production, because the, the explanation, the commodity explanation, explains why you produce more outputs than inputs. And that, again, comes with the role of both capital and labour and energy in doing that. But when you get to trying to sell something, uh, looking at the MCM plus circuit, um, in the first stage, exchange value is dominant. You, you want to buy, you're buying something for its cost of production. You're going to exploit its use value. When you want to go from the actual product you've made to selling it, then what you're selling has to have use value, not just in the individual commodity now, but relative to the total amount of demand that's out there. So um, to actually get that money, you have to realise the excess surplus commodities you've produced, you've got to actually be able to sell. Okay? And that's both the individual use, use, use for what you're selling, but also the aggregate demand that exists. So you get a realisation problem coming up. It's very easy to produce a physical surplus. It's much harder to turn that physical surplus into money because you've got to sell the stuff you produce. People are going to be willing to buy it off you. So now you get effective demand turning up as part of the whole process. Uh, Realisation did appear identical with producing a surplus, but now when you've got to actually sell it, the commodity is, it has an exchange value only at the same time as it's also a use value. And there has to be sufficient demand for it. So Marx has now got a concept of, of, of aggregate demand, again coming out of this dialectic. There's new value and value as such. It presents a, a, a barrier in the magnitude of available equivalents, money, primarily money. You've got to be able to turn these surplus goods you produce into money. And therefore, effective demand becomes another part of the issue. So now um, you get... Stuff in Marx, which predates Keynes, particularly in the Grundrisse and Volume 3 of Capital. And the bottom line is that use value now dominates over exchange value. You've now flipped what matters at this stage of the analysis. So for, for effective demand, you've got a, you know, looking at the CMC circuit, you have commodities, uh, the foreground is the use value, is essential for sale. The background, and you've done it for make a profit, the tension is you might fail to realise that profit you might lose money either individually or in the aggregate level of aggregate demand. So you now have an inversion of the importance of use value and exchange value. Again, this is what you can do with this concept that enables you to expand the field of, of, of analysis beyond just making a surplus to realising a surplus to the role of money and so on. And with money, uh, if you look at the conventional interpretation of money, they treat money as being equivalent to labour value. That's pretty much the, the way that most Marxists think about it about money. But I quoted that phrase when Marx is talking about treating the wages being equivalent to the value of labour power. He said all these fixed suppositions themselves become fluid in the further course of development. He was treating money as gold effectively. 
in the first volume of Capital, just to leave out thinking about the monetary system. At a later stage, you find him having a credit theory of money. And this comes up when he's talking about how do you put a price on borrowed money? He said, what does the industrial capitalist pay and what's the price of loaned capital? So what the buyer of an ordinary commodity buys is its use value. What he pays is its value. He said, but what the borrower of money buys is its use value, but what does he pay for it? Surely not its price or value. In other words, if you could buy money for its cost of production, you give somebody five cents and get a one pound note back. Okay? So that can't happen. So what the hell are you paying? What is the price of money? He says the borrower is paying not the exchange value of money, but its use value. Its use value lies in producing profit. So you're after money for its use value. So the use value of money determines its price. Again, this inversion is very simply and logically, when you expand the field of of observation, they they, they fall together beautifully. So the value of money does does not depend upon the the, uh, the quantity of surplus labour uh, that one's making them, but the surplus they can produce for the person who buys them. So you get the exchange value of money is set by its use value. So here we have money, which is both, a, and again, money is another one of these things which has foreground and, as, and background aspects. To it. It's a commodity because it's essential for exchange and we use it in exchange, but it's not produced by means of other commodities. If you go out and produce money using other commodities, you get arrested for forgery. Okay. To produce money, you've got to have a banking license or you've got to be the government itself. So he's saying, this is actually Marx's logic, he's saying all the relations would be irrational from the standpoint of ordinary commodity. So you've now expanded to what he's considering finance, again in the same use value, exchange value framework. So if we want to call interest the price of money capital, it's an irrational form of price, quite at variance for the concept of price of commodities. Now you think about what the neoclassicals do. They try to reduce everything back to supply and demand. Okay. What sets the interest rate? Supply and demand. What sets the um, price of labour? Supply and demand. Okay, Marx is not saying that. He's saying these are some things where the price setting is quite different to the cost of production basis that determines other products. So how can a product have a price which is not its value? And again, this is all logic in the third volume of capital. And you can see the extent to which he's saying this is going well beyond the boundaries of the standard use value, exchange value logic. What is sold as its use value? Its function in this case is to produce exchange value to yield a profit. Uh, So you get a subjective determination of the price you're willing to pay for money and capital assets. And uncertainty also becomes part of the logic. So you now get a dialectic of money as well. So you have the MCM plus circuit now. We're looking at money. The foreground is it's a commodity, it's essential for exchange. The background is it's not a commodity. You can't produce it using other commodities. So its exchange value will be set by its use value. Now, what's its use value? Well, it's going to be subjective. There's no objective basis for the rate of interest. Uh, And again, Marx says competition doesn't determine the rate of interest. There's no law that enforces a a natural rate of interest. Again, very different to the neoclassicals way of thinking about it. Again, they try to reduce everything to supply and demand to get a natural price. Um, so it's something arbitrary and lawless. Uh, interest is merely part of profit paid. The maximum limit of interest paid is profit itself. Of course, it can exceed that as we found in the real world. But the minimum is altogether indeterminable. Again, very rich thinking about finance, which you won't find if you stick to seeing Marx as well, based on the labour theory of value and seeing money as being uh, a labour equivalent in that sense. So you get a pricing of capital, which also has a dialectic to it because... Here's where Marx had a lot of fun at the expense of Ricardo, saying, how do you value an asset like a mineral deposit before you've actually started to work on it? He said, the compensation given for the mine is paid for the value of the coal or stone, which can be removed and has no connection with the original and structural powers of the land. This is Ricardo. Now, Marx says, no, there's a very significant connection with the original and structural productions of the soil. But the word value here is as ugly as repaid where the profit was above. He says, well, an undeveloped mine has no labour that's gone into it. Therefore, there's no value. In other words, it's free. It exists there. You might be able to cost you to mine it, but you're not when you pay for it, you're not paying for its value in the, in the classical sense of the word from Marx because no effort has gone into mining it as yet. So in, in terms of the energy where production function that I've taken you through, Minerals and energy are free gifts of nature. 
the exchange value is set by the cost of discovery and mining, but you're not paying for the actual stuff itself. So the use value is, is the capacity to perform work later, and the valuation of that use value of this mine also has a subjective and speculative element to it. And here's Marx again ripping into Ricardo, saying Marx never uses the word value for utility. Does he mean, therefore, that the compensation paid to the owner of quarries and mines is paid for the value of the coal and stone before they're removed from the quarry in their original state, in the ground? He says, then he invalidates his entire doctrine of value. And I love this phrase. What does value mean here? As it must do, the possible use value and hence the prospective exchange value of the coal or stone. In other words, your subjective valuation of what you think you're going to get out of the stuff is what you're willing to pay as a price for it. So now you get capital assets turning up as another dialectic. The value of capital assets is set by their use value, but that depends upon your expectations of an uncertain future. Possible use value, prospective exchange value. So you're now getting three price levels turning up in March. You've got the dialectic of the commodity that explains where surplus comes from and commodities exchanging their values. The dialectic of labour that explains why the wage exceeds subsistence, and the dialectic of money capital that the exchange rate is set by the prospective use value. And you can also go on to consider things like unique products or you know, newly produced goods. Things like, you know, I'm, always, I'm always a buyer of new technology, so I've got this 3D camera I showed you guys last week. It doesn't work all that well yet, unfortunately. Um, but that I was willing to pay a price far beyond its cost of production. At some point, they'll become stock standard and you'll pay the cost of production. But the initial pricing is going to be subjective. People are going to behave much more than it costs to produce them because they really like cool gear. And I'm a victim of the cool gear syndrome. So with new commodities, think about a new commodity in this case. A commodity, what we call a commodity, applies to things which are not just produced for sale but are also used to produce other commodities. And Ricardo was actually better about this than Marx was. He's talking about some things which scarcity or quality determine um, their price. He said their value is totally independent of the amount of labour that goes into them. So you don't pay for a, for a you don't pay for a Picasso painting the cost of the materials and the labour that Picasso put into the painting. You're paying for the uniqueness. So you get subjective price levels turning up for those sorts of commodities. And then also with innovation, uh, if you have in society you have new products, the foreground of them is they're not just yet to reduce to use other commodities. The background they are produced by commodities. So your price is going to, your price you're going to be willing to pay for them will be set by subjective utility. So again, you can see how you can flip from one basis to another of how value is set using this very, very deep logic from Marx. And you get a complex systems approach coming out as well. You get multiple conflicting related price levels. You have normal commodities set by basically input-output pricing, but they're not a, a static equilibrium vector, which is what the Serapians got stuck themselves. And also energy has to come in here, and I think... So when I bring energy, when I bring energy into the Schraffian pricing system, I'll get a rather different resolution than what Schraffer got to that particular issue. Uh, labor, you get subsistence as a minimum wage, and you then get credit to price style dynamics, which I'll show you in future weeks coming out of the distribution of income. You've got effective demand. You have periodic failures to realise surplus value, leading to crises. And money and capital assets, you're going to get cycles and expectations, which Minsky spoke about very, very well, and Minsky was very heavily influenced by Marx. And you're going to have non-reproducible products where you're going to have pricing set by subjective valuations, which is where the Austrians have got some relevance. So it's a, it's a much more richer vision of, of macroeconomics than you can get out of the neoclassicals by a large margin, but also than you get out of the classical school of the post-Keynesians once you get this organising framework. So you invalidate Say's law, and I'll take you through that in a couple of weeks' time. You have money and debt creation as integral parts of capitalism. You get all these dynamics coming out of it. To me, it's really a foundation for non-neoclassical um, economics. And you, you, again, it's consistent with the laws of thermodynamics. You can explain where the surface comes from involving the role of energy. And profit arises because capitalists exploit this gap between use value and exchange value, the inputs to production. Now, if you're finding this stuff, it's been there by nature, not you having to manufacture the coal and the iron. That's where a large part of the profit comes from. So all sorts of, of rich elements to Marx's logic, uh, far more so than you can get out of, of you know, horses for courses approach. So you have this general dialectic of the commodity. 
you have the social framework giving you um, the, 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 the role of the commodity in capitalism. You have the source of surplus value, both labour and machinery. You then get the income distribution dynamics over labour. You get effective demand. And you also get the money and banking system. And finally, new commodities. So to me, it's a very rich foundation for thinking about capitalism. And I'll take you through a lot more of that next week. Let's have a bit of a chat.